everybody, and welcome to the Alien vs. Predator Galaxy podcast, the original Alien and Predator podcast. This is Aaron Percival, a.k.a. Corporal Hicks, and joining me as usual are my fellow cold weather explorers. Adam Zeller, a.k.a. Ridgetop. Eric Adams, also known as Xenomorphine. And for this special 20th anniversary podcast for Alien vs. Predator... Or, sorry, it's AVP Alien versus Predator. That's how they marketed it, isn't it? Um, we've brought in two special guests. The first up is making his second podcast appearance, I believe, is uh, none other than the founder of our little community, Mr. Darkness. Welcome, Darkness. Hi, good to be here. <laughs> That's a lie. I know he's lying to <laughs> us. <laughs> <laughs> But more on that later. And also joining us for his third podcast appearance is a very old hand within the community. If you frequent our message boards, if you've been around the online alien and predator community for a while, you have probably argued with him. You have probably been informed by him. It is Sil. Uh, thank you for that very kind and generous introduction. Glad to be here. <laughs> um, so... There's a lot to talk about here. It's it's 20, 20 years. It's a big part of at least the top rows history of the fandom, and definitely darkness. Definitely darkness as well. I can't I can't neglect that. Eric, you can't you can't raise your hand. You you're an old boy, remember? Yeah, but it's still a big part of. Uh, okay, well, okay. I'll let I'll let you. I'll like let it you... was right in there at the start of the comics, so. Well, Way back. We, we're talking the game, eh, not the game. We're talking the film here, so that's more my, um, yeah, more my point. So we'll we'll start as we always tend to on these kind of movie retrospectives, and that's you know the first time that we saw them, how uh, our opinions at the time, and how if at all they've sort of changed. Um, over the intervening 20 years and who we're going to start with this too this too big of a cast today um let's start with our guest let's start with Sil. okay um so i was 13 at the time i was probably like the ideal target audience for this film because i was 13 years old i was a big fan of the series and i just remember the excitement leading up to it because i've been reading the comic from the library reading internet rumors for years about like when there's going to be an AVP film. And so to finally actually be able to see it on the big screen, like the, the trailer was amazing. The lead up, the promotional material leading up to it was amazing. And I just remember, I liked it so much when I finally got to see it. I didn't ever like the fact that it was like set on earth or anything like that, but there was just something, I don't know. It, I, like I said, I was the ideal target market for that film. And finally getting to sit down in the theater with an alien and a predator film at the same time was just really special. And I, it was actually, I've only seen three films in theater twice, and that was one of them. And both times were just like, this is great. This is fun. Second time I went to see it, my mate sitting there next to me laughing at every special effect in the film. Didn't even get mad. Like, I'm having fun. I'm going to ignore you. You're a dick. Whatever. Then it came out on DVD, immediately bought the special edition, immediately went through every single special feature, kept watching the film, and it was like, by the third viewing, I started realizing, like, third viewing on DVD, so like the fifth time I'd seen the film finally, that's how much I liked it, I realized, actually, this takes a while to get going. Actually, I don't like those sound effects for The Predator. Actually, I don't like this. Actually, I don't like that. And it just immediately wore off on me and for ages i just kind of completely spoiled on it for a while it didn't touch it didn't watch it avp requiem came out and that's a whole other story um but these days i've kind of gone back to like it's almost a comfort film just because of when it came out in my life and like it was actually such a cool time it was nice to have that lead up to it it was the payoff of like years and years of waiting for this film to happen and like these days i enjoy it it's not the best of the series. It's not the worst of the series. I, I just have fun with it. 
like at this point in my life, the only thing that annoys me about that film is that the sound effects are so shit. <laughs> like every I mean, time an film. alien, huh? like every time I mean, an alien, like shoulder cannon. Out. No, oh god, the shoulder cannon is just like the most generic sound effect. Every time an alien's yeah. tongue comes out, it's that knife sharpening sound, and it's like, let me love you. I, I've I've come to terms with the fact that you take forever to get started. I've come to terms with the fact that you're not as good as the other films. I've come to terms with everything I learned to hate about you. Just let me love you. But no, here's that same squelchy sound effect every single time someone gets hit. But honestly, like any time I think back about when that film actually came out, it was such a nice experience. I got to see it with my dad, who had seen the original films and my brothers who'd got me into the series because they would borrow the books from the library, seeing it on the big screen, that scene where they blast, the, the Predators blast the hole with the spaceship, like that rushing forward that happens on the big screen with the surround sound, that was like a roller coaster ride, both times I saw it. I was like, the big, I actually think that's why the DVD started wearing off me because you don't get that effect when you're watching it at home. And so suddenly all that luster starts wearing off, but actually going there, watching the trailers, hearing the ad playing on the radio, like waiting for it to come out. It's just, it was a good time. I enjoyed it. Adam, how about you? I mean, it was, it was also just such a great time for me. And I think I was in that target demographic as well. I was 16 when it finally did come out, but I was just kind of getting into the alien and predator franchise um, a year or so earlier. You know, my parents finally let me, start watching the movies. I was playing the games. I was reading the comic books and I had heard rumors about this for a while. And it was because I was into the game alien versus predator two that I knew about the website, ABP galaxy. And then that became a resource for following developments, rumors and updates about this film that was coming. And I'd really only had this kind of hype experience for a film one time before. And that was Jurassic park three if anyone remembers Dan's um, JP3 page, I would just follow everything about that movie uh, before it came out. And so this is the second time I kind of got that experience. And it was just so cool sharing this hype with all these people online. You know, I kind of, uh, Utah's a bit bigger now, but I kind of grew up in a smaller town at the time. And so just getting on and being able to nerd out with with fellow people online was was a treat. Um. And yeah, I remember, I think my dad got me the Alien Quadrilogy set on DVD. And uh, oh, this was a bit after. We saw we saw Alien, the director's cut in October of 2003, which is the first one I saw in theaters. And part of the reason I went was there were rumors that this AVP teaser trailer was attached. And, you know, we don't often see teaser trailers uh, that come out before the movie has really fully been shot right um because this was just a a couple of test images really of the suits and i don't believe they had done principal photography yet at that point right aaron i don't believe so yeah so i mean it's not like movies today i remember they had like a, a behind the scenes video before they even started filming that came online where oh, paul maybe. anderson yeah, yeah showed all this concept art and gave his his idea and vision for the movie um he you could see all the walls of concept art for the movie you know we release a few pieces of concept art now and it's like whoa but it back then they would just like show you and maybe it was uncommon at the time too all this stuff before they even started filming um so just that experience of, of hype and this is before social media really took off too so i remember the film's website just going there and they had like the ambience they had that one predator two track where um harrigan's in the ship that was just this like spooky kind of ambience and they would have wallpapers and all this other stuff so there was just such a hype built around this film and when i finally saw it movie.com yeah that's right when i finally saw it um couldn't find any midnight screenings in the area i don't think it was quite that big here um i I was pretty happy with it. Um, I mean, yeah, there were there were things even at the time. I was like, oh, this is the first PG-13 one in the franchise. I'm sure we'll talk about that. But at the time, you know, like you said, Joe, just seeing 
an alien and a predator fight each other on the big screen. Like that was just so cool for me at that age. And yeah, through the years as you rewatch it, I, I've also rewatched it and gone back and been like, eh, this, yeah, there's some things that could be better about it. But it just holds such a special place for me. And those first impressions, they're hard to fully go away. Even if you do see more of the flaws over time, I think. Okay, Darkness, how about yourself? Um, well, as you know, I was pretty devastated when I saw avp i mean i wasn't i wasn't one of these fans who were you know pining for a avp movie since predator 2 i didn't know you know avp was a concept until i um bought the you know the predator dvd special edition and there was an avp2 demo on there and that's that's how i knew avp was a concept and i was just blown away blown away by by how good that game was so obviously that's what the site was about, wasn't it? It was AVP2. So we, then we started branching out into reporting on the, you know, the movie news and all that coming out. And and I had a lot of free time, you know, after I, I was 19, I would, I'd finished college. I'd, I was struggling to get a job. Um, so I had a lot of free time at that, that period. And, you know, it, a lot of the the marketing was absolutely brilliant. You know, the I I don't I can't speak for you a lot, but I I've never been as excited for a film as for for AVP and all the films since then. You know, okay, if it's good, it's good. It's it's bad, it's bad. No big deal. And it's sort of you know, it's not the end of the world because I I feel like after AVP. I just don't think we can get anything worse than than Requiem. And a big part of, you know, I, I hated the movie and and a lot of the things I said, I, I was, I, I don't know, I, I think I was insane because I, I was nitpicking about everything that was wrong with AVP. And I, I, at the time, I was probably more of a Predator fan um, than Alien, although, you know, I was, I'm into both really. But I, I probably edged towards a Predator fan, and the, the way they treated Predators in AVP was just awful. Um, and but generally, up to the PG thirteen, that that's when okay, that's when the red flag started for me. And then I don't know if you remember any cool news that was quite big back in those days. And the. I think the post there were preview screening one the just before, and the the ma- amount of negativity that you just read on Ain't Cool News and it it just demotivated you quite a bit. And I I remember one of the comments I still remember it now that when they were recounting like you know the the team up at the end, oh it looks like uh, it looks like the Predator and Lex were about to start kissing and and I just and again just another example. And then the the film came out, and a lot of what they said was true. Um, I mean, watching it back last night, you know, it isn't as bad, but that's mainly due to Requiem. But the the thing is, I actually, I, you know, when you compare it to Requiem, I th- I thought Anderson, what Anderson did with the Antarctica saying was absolutely brilliant. You know, it, obviously. Earth were never going to be ideal, was it? Because the whole point was Ripley was going to stop them from ever getting to Earth. But oh no, they've already been on here. But compared to what they did in Requiem, the, the Antarctica setting were brilliant. Um, and there, you know, there is there is a few good things in both AVP and Requiem. Um, the sets, you, you know, he did a hell of a lot for the budget. Um, and the miniature, um, and the the special effects, I suppose. And the, the queen, you know, we, we have to remember that this is the last time we saw a queen in, in a film. And the, the queen in there, it's doing things that it never did in, in Aliens or Resurrection. And I, I can't find a single complaint, really, with the queen. I thought it was, I thought what he did with that was brilliant. Um, But the, the PG-13 definitely hurt the film for me. 
because I was I was expecting a hard art. And the thing is, if it had just come out at the start and said, right, you know, we're, we're making a PG-13 film, you know, I might not have had that such negative reaction as I did. But he, he sort of did imply that, oh, yes, it's going to be very hard. The violence, it's, it's so violent. And then after the film had come out, somebody were doing an interview with Anderson and they asked him like, oh, because there were sort of like conspiracy theories about that the film had been cut, which it hadn't. And uh, and he said, no, no, it's it was always meant to be PG-13 from the start. And I just think, well, why didn't you say that? You know, and just be upfront with everybody instead of just implying it, we're going to be R-rated. So that's the PG-13. And I, and I, I guess... I mean, there is blood, you know, when I was watching it in the last night, there is blood in, you know, you can see it on the wrist blades and in various places. But I just think it it definitely hurts the film for me. And the dialogue, the, the dialogue is just cringeworthy. Um, and it's the it's the homages, which I don't I don't mind, you know, the sort of in in frame references, but it's the dialogue when you when they're saying this butchering classic lines that Anna used to say and for, and it's just been censored for PG-13 come on but for me it's the the team up and you know it's not a bad movie up up towards that point and when I see the team up I just th there's nothing as bad in the entire franchise as that moment when they are going on the sledge thing in slow motion, running in slow motion. And with different ed editing, you know, it, it wouldn't have looked as bad. And, and maybe even Scar could have, you know, found a different way up uh, instead of just <laughs> riding the sledge. Um, and, the, uh, yeah, we're looking at the deleted scenes and the, there were one, like, where Grid is actually on the surface. I don't know how he got there. And... Uh, so I don't know if there were more deleted scenes that we've just not seen a lot, but I just think it could have been so differently that that five minute block and then him taking his mask off and and yeah and and now we're reading in the book that they were sort of saying that you know they're, they're trying to make him sort of like a romantic lead and trying to humanize the predators um and all that and then obviously the predator design. Which I know ADI has got a lot of flack for over the years, but a lot of that was Anderson sort of requesting that, you know, that it has those features. Um, but no, it's, it's hated it when it first came out, but I, I did get the DVD a few years after. Um, and I did review it. And it over the years, my opinion has sort of. Okay, it's it's not as bad. It's not it's nowhere near as bad as what I thought it was. Well, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. And when you, because yeah, you had taken down the site because again you had felt like it was a, you had put all this energy into this thing that ended up being a massive disappointment for you. Did you do that shortly after the movie came out? Like pretty quickly after it came out, right? Yeah, I think it was just. A few days after maybe okay and i think I'd, I'd you know it's just a just felt like a big colossal waste of my time um that i'd spent on reporting news for it and that the whole i mean we never even had proper hosting did we yeah. back then well i was always using like free servers and things like that and T35. I'm having a, what t35 I remember yeah that. How do you remember that yeah and um that was causing me a lot of trouble and then obviously I, I I got a job, the job that I'm still doing now, a few days before AVP came out. And I don't know if that sort of subconsciously played a part where obviously I didn't have time to dedicate as much time to the site because of me working now. Um, but no, it was, yeah, I, I did. I just, I thought, I mean, it's one of the worst decisions I ever made. You know, there's no denying it. You know, I was young. Um, and uh, I should never have done it. You know, there were there's so many people, you know, relying on us. Well, even with that, I think there was just such an excitement when the site finally came back. Because I know I was 
bummed out when it just disappeared and i was like oh no i wanted to talk to other fans about this movie surely somebody else liked it too right and uh but then i just remember finding avp galaxy again out of nowhere in late 2006 when we started hearing things about the next avp film and i remember getting on that forum and there just being such an excitement of the site being back because everybody had these great memories of even regardless of, of how they felt about AVP, just the lead up, the hype for that movie and that sense of, of community that has been maintained yeah. ever since. Yeah, I mean, that's what I said is that I don't think we're ever going to get that again, really, that sort of enthusiasm. For but then, don't, don't you think we kind of approached that when we were in the Prometheus era? No, I, I mean, I don't, I mean, I didn't really like Prometheus. And, and I, 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 know. I, I didn't. It was all right, but I just, it, you know, it didn't really feel like a proper film in in the series, did it? But but like the the lead up and the excitement to this, you know, is this an alien? I was film? yeah. I was never. I was never excited for Prometheus as I was for AVP personally for me. Um, but you know, and I often sort of wonder after Requiem whether. Is it even possible to make an AVP film? Um, because I don't really want the comics stuff taken from the comics. I know you guys like that, and and then that's what Anderson did in it. Is is the whole team? It was was um, what, what's the name, Machiko. But I didn't really like all that comic stuff, and and I just don't think they're ever gonna do an AVP film that's going to sort of make everybody happy. And I'd still, I'd still like to be part of it, you know. I'd, we, you know, it'd be brilliant to be part of that again. So I'd, I wouldn't sort of, you know, not want one, but I just I just don't think I'd be uh, enthusiastic given how they treated Requiem. I do feel like you're an outlier there, though, because you were never really a fan of the expanded universe in general. Whereas I think most people would be quite excited if we did get the comics. I mean, yeah. 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 Okay. Maybe Joe disagrees there as well. I do feel like it would be a majority opinion though. It would be a majority opinion, but I've just been rereading it lately and you realize it's like the aliens don't do anything in this. Like literally the predators do all the work and then the aliens show up at the end, get their asses handed to them, blow up the end. It's like, okay, that's, that's where you need to revisit Peter Briggs rather than necessarily the comic itself. Yes, he fixes um, that very, very well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I have I have read um since obviously at the time a friend actually had given me the first AVP comic book series, funnily enough, before AVP came out. But and then obviously I had a very sort of negative view of comics and novels back then. And I have read pretty much all the comics well the apart from the last few years worth i have read all the comics now apart from the crossovers so i am in a much better place now with the comics um but i just i just don't know if it would ever work for me did you read thicker than blood uh i wouldn't be able to tell you off the top of my head i'd have to go the last dark horse one no, I've not read that. No. Read that one. That's a good one. Yeah. I mean, I very much enjoy that one. Um, well, how, how about you, Eric? Uh, tell us your experience seeing this movie. Well, um, um, Aaron and me did an interview with Peter Briggs not very long ago. It was a really good interview. If people want to know my feelings, like during that era before we got the film, it's very much I talk about it there I come from that era of I got into the early comics so I remember not just the original comic but I remember the little news sections we used to have in the aliens comic which used to come out the magazine yeah the magazine um and I remember all the old rumors about like Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich this is before Independence Day and they'd come fresh off Universal Soldier. They were going to helm it, which I assume was because Universal Soldier did like science fiction based in the jungle. I don't know. That's my assumption. And they would probably have been able to keep things under budget back then. Um, 
and yeah, this is one of those production hell things. And I remember that that um, book. A lot of us here remember dissecting aliens, where they talk about the greatest thing that was never filmed, and we all know about the Peter Briggs script. And of course, there was that second draft, which has never leaked. Um, and then it came to it's been greenlit. Now this time. This time it's been greenlit, really? Yeah, no, this time it's the real deal. Who's going to be helming it? Paul Anderson. And a bunch of us, I remember, went, that Paul Anderson? Event Horizon Paul Anderson? Oh, okay. It felt like they were going to go in the right kind of direction because when you say Alien versus Predator, it it evokes emotions, right? Especially back then because you have to remember... The last respective films would have been Alien Resurrection, Predator 2. But you tend to drift back to Aliens and Predator. And if you manage to get them right, it should be something that's impossible to get wrong. So a lot of people were kind of, we'd become a little jaded and sceptical. Could they get it right? But we were hearing Paul Anderson, okay, he's done a Resident Evil, but Event Horizon, if he does it like that, great. And we started to get little hints. I'd, I'd forgotten all about the website yet. Yeah, thank you, Adam, with the music and all the rest of it. Um, I think the first shot we got, we carried it was that Predator in the Pyramid Corridor, and it looked on the money. Um, and of course, so that shot f- they filmed of the Predator. Yes, and we got that first teaser trailer which is like the Alien 3 on Earth, not everyone will hear you scream, equivalent for AVP. It's a genuinely good teaser. I remember I was um, a Buffy the Vampire Slayer convention and they played it there on like a big sort of projector screen. Didn't get a lot of applause or anything, but I could kind of like, I could tell even though these weren't sci-fi fans, they was like, oh, that's interesting. And we were getting these little hints of, okay, as long as it, it feels good. It's an action movie, and they introduce some horror. This could lead to some things. And it came for the big day. I think I'd heard some reviews about it, but um, I went in it. I had no expectations, but I was just hoping, okay, I'm going to see what it's like. We're, we've got Lance Henriksen at least. He's going to put in a decent performance. Um, I think my view was ironic because... Roland Emmerich, Dean Devlin were names cast in the hat. It kind of felt like the Independence Day of the Alien and Predator verse. It's uh, it's it's entertaining. It's got good pacing. There are some good ideas. There are the, like Sonal Lathan. She puts in. I actually, I think she puts in a decent performance given what she has to work with in the script as Lex Wood. There are a lot of little things that are. Like, oh, that's interesting, that's interesting. The the historical flashback on the pyramid, money shots galore. Um, And yet... Sorry, just before you go on from there, I've got a a comment with you saying the money shot thing. Yeah. One of the things I always associate with AVP is The Simpsons. Because there was was an old Fox trailer. There was an old Fox trailer where it was like an amalgamation of loads of Fox projects, blah, blah, blah. blah. Right. And there's a bit um, in this trailer where Homer Simpson goes, and now for the money shot, and it cuts to that bit from AVP of the uh, <laughs> of the pyramid exploding. I did not know that, but that works very well, yes. Um, but yeah, it has, concept-wise, it has a lot. Of, I remember the concept art, the concept art, what we got at the time that was leaked, it was like, this could be interesting. You heard that the producer, he said that Paul Anderson pitched it like Jaws. I thought, this it sounds like he's listening to the right kind of things. But it felt like there were all these ideas that were tossed at the wall, but they didn't quite gel. And you didn't get the tension. And a film like Alien vs. Predator like it or loathe it, it is going to be based on what happens when you see them fight. And unfortunately for me, it did kind of feel like two guys in rubber suits. You did not get the feeling you got from Predator, Predator 2, at least the first 
two alien films where these were living, breathing creatures. You toss those at one another. This should be Clash of the Titans. This should not be something a human would last five seconds in. And it, you had this kind of, like, the, even the music felt, like it didn't feel like a pop music, but it, it felt like percussion heavy and do, 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 like a James Bond type of true lies kind of thing. It didn't feel like an alien and predator film should. Um, since then, I mean, you could say it felt a little video gamey, maybe. Um, but since then, it's kind of weirdly lined up with, like, the Predator and stuff like that. It does have a kind of, looking back, it is kind of fits with that vibe. But I remember walking out of the cinema, and it was a very British thing, when I just heard some people, and I was interested as a fan, like, what other people would be making of this? And the first voice I heard behind me was, that was a bit shit, weren't it? And he just walked out. And <laughs> that seemed to be the reaction. People were geared up, alien, predator, what happened? You can't get this wrong. And they got the wrong. With that said, didn't get it nearly as wrong as it could have. It was a bit like um, Terminator 3. People didn't like it, but all the Terminator sequels since then, it's kind of been diminishing returns. And people look back at a Terminator 3 and they go, actually compared to what we eventually had wasn't bad it was entertaining but it wasn't a good terminator film and that's kind of what i get with this i rewatched it again last night first time i've seen it on a decently sized screen since the cinema and like darkness says it's not as bad as i kind of would go oh avp like i never hated it but i do remember feeling a little underwhelmed but I rewatched it and I thought, yeah, actually, it's not too bad as a film. It's just, it's a bit generic for an alien or predator film. So it's just, it's not as good as it could or should have been. And we needed Anderson to be an event horizon mindset, not Resident Evil mindset. And he said in an interview a bit after that, that that was the one of the things he did. He did it Resident Evil mindset. And it does feel like Resident Evil. It's weird, but it, it I mean same director but it is weird it does feel like it would fit right in with that first resident evil film um if it had been done like event horizon with that kind of pacing and structure and not just flinging ideas just make them cohesive then do it i think we could have had not magic but something that people would have regarded as yeah i like this give us some more but yeah, it, the execution wasn't there. That was that's my that's my very long winded view. Yeah, can I just quickly with the whole pyramid flashback? As I was saying about like the sound effects associate, does anybody remember watching that first trailer and how cool that sound was when the pyramid explodes? And then you watch the film, and it's the laziest, goddamn lamest, limpest, like. Zing! Like I hate, and they had you the just remind me of that. Watch it. I'm expecting that big sound from the trailer, yes. and it's just not there. It's like, why didn't you just take the sound from the trailer? Someone did yes. a good job. <laughs> why have you yeah, I assume, I assume they got the footage and they went, no, we need to amp this up for the trailer. For yeah, them. exactly. And they should have just like somebody should have watched them. They acted that that was better. Let's just use that. There were some different effects in the lead up videos. I remember like the the plasma caster energy being red in like in all the lead up yes. videos, yeah. and yeah. then. I mean, I, I was kind of glad that stuck through, it's, but... It's showing well, its older technology, and I thought, yeah, yeah do that. Because and... it was only in the flashback scene. It wasn't in the rest of the film. Because it looks like Predators have been using the same gear. They like they go to sleep like engineers for 100 years. They wake up, yeah, let's put this on. Okay, I'm going back to sleep. And it's it's the same equipment. They even look like they've got the same masks. It's, um, yeah. So that's potentially something interesting about the Predators as well. Is, is the stagnancy of the technology, but that's a, a whole other thing. Well, how about you, Aaron? How was your lead up and viewing for the first time? So AVP was the first of the films I got to see on the big screen. I was a year too young to go and watch the director's cut when that came out, which is funny now actually thinking about it because uh, 
as of recording, we've recently had the news of the UK's rating of Alien Romulus and everybody's losing the shit over it being a, a 15 and it's like, hang fire now the Alien films have been 15 in the UK since the last 20 years. <laughs> calm, calm, calm your tits, you're fine, we're good. Um, but no, I was I was only 14 at the time. So AVP was my first opportunity to see some see an alien or a predator film on the big screen. And like Joe, like Adam, I was in that bracket. Darkness was a four, four or five years older than me at that point. And I, re- I remember having such fond memories of the promotion, of the lead up. You know, I I didn't work with D at that point. I had my own shitty little website um, called AVP World that I had created before. Before AVP was announced. I can't remember exactly when, but it was before. Because that, that, that news ended up being one of the first big pieces I remember actually posting about and being all excited about it. I was like holy shit I've put this effort into this website and now I get to um, report on all this uh, all this cool shit coming up so I remember competing with D for the, the you know the first posting and all that kind of bullshit that was so important to us as, as you know teenagers um, and I just I, I have so many fond memories of re-watching like the trailer i watched those trailers so many fucking times you know um the uh what did you say this room was called um the moment i that is burned into my head from the trailers um sacrificial chamber and then all the fast cuts and everything and even like the rock music trailer you know at one point i could friggin uh, hum that uh, hum that track along not now i'll be honest not now i should have gone and revisited those when uh, i was um re-watching the film and rereading the scripts and stuff uh, for this episode but for that purpose alone i have a huge soft spot for this film J- just purely from those associated memories purely from that marketing and purely from a community point of view you know i might that might have been competing with AVP Galaxy at that point, but D and I used to talk a lot. So there's a, a personal sort of fondness for the film in that regards. I remember going to see the film on, it was not long after my 15th birthday, if I remember rightly, because we got it, we got it late October, I think, in the UK. It was an August release in the US, we got it late October. It must have been like October 28th or something like that. Well, it wasn't long after my birthday. And I remember going to the local nerd shop that still exists, and I still have my poor list too, till this day, um, to get the movie, Movie Maniacs 7 or 8 Corporal Hicks figure that looked absolutely nothing like Michael Bean, and also to pick up the AVP Thriller The Hunt, uh, the little digest comic that... Well, kind of, not really followed on from AVP, but there we are, Adam showing it on the camera. Um, but followed the aesthetic. And then I remember going to see the film. I always enjoyed it. At least back then. I always enjoyed it. Um, you know, I was I was 15. I was that age bracket that just wanted cool fucking monsters smashing each other about. And I at the time, was quite happy with, you know, with the fight scenes. But as I've, in the intervening 20 years, I flip-flop around with it a lot. So sometimes I'll watch it and I'll be entertained. Sometimes I'll watch it and be like, ugh, Resurrection's better than this. And I'll I'll be honest, the the first, when I, I've rewatched it three times in the last two weeks, um, you know, with the various commentaries and, and just watching it on its own. And the first time I watched it was probably the first time in two or three... No, that's a lie. I watched it when I scanned in that script, Joe. I had it sat on in the background when I was scanning in that first draft. But it was it was background noise. I wasn't really paying attention to it. This was the first time in years I'd sat and paid attention to it. 
and it was one of those times where I was like, you know, I'd rather be watching Resurrection right now than than this film. And then when I watched it with the Anderson commentary, I was like, oh, it's actually kind of fun. So I, I'm all over the place when it comes to EVP um, because it is a film, like we've said, that has on one hand some bits of value. You know, it, it does bits good. And then on the other hand, there's the crap characters. There's... Um, uh, Oh, pardon me. Um, there's the crap characters. There's the, there's the fact it's not the AVP that the majority of us wanted, and the romantic hair, the big floppy dreadlocks, and stuff like that. So I am never in any particular. It's not like AVPR where I'm just like this is fucking shit. Um, it, it's not like Alien or Aliens where I'm like this is fucking awesome. It's just it. It depends a lot on my mood at the time. But because of that personal history yeah i'm always gonna have this minor soft spot for it uh, it's the only film i haven't seen three times in the cinema of all the alien and, and predator films i've seen them all at least three times in the cinema and avp i only saw twice and that was because i was a 15 year old with no job and had no money and the second time i saw it was because over here in the uk they released like a two-pack a DVD of Aliens and Predator, and it came with like a behind the scenes featurette in it, and there was also a ticket to see AVP for free. And I think I think that was one of the things I got for my birthday was this box set. And uh, I remember going on my Billy Todd to the cinema to watch this film, and and the cashier, you know, the guy, the guy at the ticketing desk, going, "I have no friggin' idea if I can accept this <laughs> this thing from your DVD or not." So. He did let me in. They let me in in the end, which was nice. But, yeah. that's. Still have the ticket? No, you had to. You had to just give it to him. I don't think oh, he's I looking now. <laughs> so it was it was this box set, Aliens and It, Predator. And I've still got the I've still got the feature, the making of Alien vs. Predator that came with it. But I don't believe there's a ticket stub in here. It's the quadrilogy release of Aliens and the special edition release of Predator. No, I don't have the, I don't have the ticket. Okay. What do we want to talk about first? Real quick, um, just to kind of wrap up the whole release thoughts. I remember being with my parents. Uh, we just so happened to be going to uh, Los Angeles around uh, the time of the movie's release. And I remember there was a planned premiere for it because uh, I think I had heard about it just with news updates on AVP Galaxy. And I remember it being canceled like for some reason or another. It just didn't happen. And so, I mean, I knew I couldn't get in the premiere or anything, but I was like, eh, I'll just at least go see it. Like, it'll be like, I'll, we'll drive by it and see the, the premiere stuff going on. I don't know, but it just ended up not happening and in the chat we are of course recording this live um so one of our patrons uh, rob harvey says an ex-girlfriend got me a poor quality pirate copy of avp way before it was even released it kind of ruined my experience for when it finally came out in the cinema I remember rightly rob's a fellow uk ian and um that would have been those um month and a bit really i'm glad they don't really do that anymore that was always stupid the the huge gaps between uh, releases in different regions can i say um when i was talking earlier about like it's it's kind of gelled a bit better with since some of the earlier films um the one thing i did forget to mention was that um weirdly prometheus has made avp better because they do, ha it's completely unintentional because we know Ridley Scott's a bore of these, he claims he never watched it. But the way that AVP introduces Wayland and they go into the whole, you know, predator, you know, alien organisms were on Earth, there was this whole civilization. AVP does do that ominous Lovecraftian, you know, here will be dragons thing in the pyramid. Um, you have scientists who actually are interested in learning instead of just get <laughs> bitchy and go, oh, yeah, you want to go there. I just want to do rock kind of thing. It, 
AVP did that side of it better than I felt Prometheus later did. You watch Prometheus the way they do it with another Wayland as well. And I think this was a big thing as well when Prometheus got there. People were saying, well, whose Wayland did you like better? And a lot of people actually sided with the Lance Henriksen. You know, it's not the same character. It's head of Wayland Corporation, you know, role. But a lot of people did prefer the Lance Henriksen version. We yeah. preferred the briefing to the crew um, scene better than the way Prometheus did it. Um, it's weird, but Prometheus has made AVP better than because back then there was nothing to compare it to. But that side of it, I do think that Anderson did better. There are a lot of very odd similarities between Prometheus and, and AVP. And uh, we're not the first ones to have taken note of that. You know, people have done articles and videos about it, and and I'm working on one still, actually. Uh, but yeah, that's that was always such a weird thing to me. I was like, wait a minute, they had the briefing scene, and they have Wayland, and then they're going in the pyramid, and this thing is at the center of the pyramid, and like, there's just so many similarities uh, when you actually just sit down and tally them up. Yeah, even, like, I the part of, like the characters are there for the same reason. Because like everyone, nobody finds out why they're there until they're almost at their destination. Everyone's just had a dump truck full of money driven up to the house, and they're like, "Hey, you want to go do something?" Like, sure. What am I doing? Just, just go to sleep. We'll, we'll tell you when we get there. Yeah, it like, felt it's the like same how... motivation for it. Yeah, it felt like when I was rewatching it. I don't remember if this struck me when I first watched it. When I was rewatching it last night, and that scene where Colin Salmon's character is approaching people, I thought he's. He's doing Jurassic Park. He's Richard Attenborough in Jurassic Park. He's just going up to people offering him money. Come to us. We would like you to attend the whatever symposium. And yeah, it's, it's even it's, more explicit in the script. Yes. Like, the the, like, the arrival of um, the like a bit dig of does the same thing with like the, the the sand covering up the dig, and he's running like, no, no turn the helicopter off, turn it off. Like they, they toned yes. it down a bit, but yeah, it's just like. That's funny because it mentions that in the anti core news review as well, don't they, Joe? Yeah, they, they the, explicitly the, say the it's Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park. Yeah. yeah. And actually, that um, when Eric was talking earlier about like how everything just feels like a bunch of hodgepodge ideas, it's really, really interesting if you w read the original draft of the script. It actually flows. It actually makes sense. And it just dies. Yeah. It's like death of a thousand cuts. It did get stripped quite a lot it feels like, i mean you, you can kind of feel it in the film as well uh, everything's very i mean i know eric kind of said it he felt it was well paced but you can almost feel a lot of yeah you, you I, I personally i personally feel you can feel them going right strip that strip that strip that yeah. oh and, yeah and, yeah and... just saying like, like as a viewing experience like it, it gets to like halfway through the film before there's the first you it's know, it's more than that. It's the credit. problem. The film is only actually 90 minutes long. There's 12 minutes of credits. So the film, the theatrical yes. version, ends oh at 88 God. minutes. The first fight scene starts at 55 minutes. So there's literally only 30 minutes in your AVP film where there's any AVP actually happening. Which is insane. Like, you're waiting 14 years for this film to come out, and it blows its load in 30 minutes. After you've had to wait 55 minutes with the a bunch of like completely uninteresting faceless characters who just kind of like, oh, what's this? I don't know. Oh, I'm dead. Mm. And it, it's annoying as well because I remember, you know, I, I think we, I joked about it on Messenger with you earlier, um, Joe. Um, yeah, the whole them trying to set it up to mimic the pacing of Alien and Aliens and Predator you know, giving your characters time to breathe and be established, uh, establish mystery. And it's just these uninteresting, dull characters on, on the screen. It's like, okay, yeah, you've given me an hour to get to know these people. Wayland is arguably the most interesting of the lot. Um, you've given me an hour and you've told me nothing. Yeah, yeah it's, it's fine when you've got some characters to establish. Yeah. But it's if like there's the not much character to establish, yeah. You took a long time to say nothing. 
Yeah. Sorry, D, were you going to say something before? Uh, uh, yeah, before I, just, I, I was going to say, I know it's a lot of similarities with Prometheus. Um, and I, I pointed a lot of them out when it came out, but it's kind of funny when, you know, Ridley Scott and that, you know, the look down on AVP and, you know, choose to sort of ignore, you know, the, the canon of it. Um, but in the but yeah, they must have sort of seen it and and taken a lot from it because it just seems too too similar, really. But I actually don't mind the um, the build up in the film. Um, I think it sort of adds to the the mystery and the the suspense. So I didn't mind that. But it's it's things like Celtic and um, at Chopper getting killed like so close together, and I just I, I was never happy about. That. The, the predator has been killed so so easily. Um, I can get you know chopper, but and I just wish they'd have sort of spaced all that out a bit more. See, this is where I think one of the strengths of AVP actually is. I think it represents both species very well. You know, yes, chopper and um, Celtic get take out, taken out very close, but it's a good representation of the species in my opinion you know chopper goes down to the alien stealth yes we'll put aside the fact that it has a fucking mega long tail um and blah 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 and celtic went down due to his arrogance you know he takes too long too long savoring that kill and and not thinking not using his intelligence to know oh shit i've fired this cutting metal thing that's gonna make the alien bleed no what does the alien do you know that is, in my opinion, them being presented quite accurately. Yeah, but I, I think what what they just said was, um, I think his problem was not the like numbers of kills or how they were cut. I, I think the thing was that they just like one predator, two predator. I, I think if they just spaced it out a bit or made more of a deal of those predators, I, I don't have any problems with the way the predators feel. Because arrogance is one of their flaws, going way back to the first part. But um, you just had that because when that still says when you've been waiting so long, like literally so long to to get this concept in live action, and then the very first kills like it's just one goes, the other goes, and um, a lot of fans do raise this. Um, another thing I forgot to say earlier. Um, there is a, a weird similarity with what we've seen in Romulus. There is a very, very, very long tail. Yeah, in the last scene. And yeah. I was wondering, is it an AVP tribute, or are they going? Are they going to do something else for that? But also extendable tail a, for plot purposes. Yeah, I mean, it might be well, like the inner jaw thing where you see they. Can if you look at the design that, of the um, tail, it does look like it could actually be designed to extend. Yeah, yeah, segmented telescopic thing. Um. But I did. I meant to say it's kind of ironic because when we were talking about the lead up to it, you had a director. People were like, okay, he's done some interesting, relevant things, and then you had the first teaser trailer. Yeah, that's good. Romulus AVP. There is a similarly. I'm hoping there's you know the execution is different, but um, that on the long tail did make me think of Romulus leading up to this. So let's hope it's a different execution. Yeah, yeah it's, I it's feel interesting. Like... Less of those first two predators as well mirrors the first two predators in the films dying. Sorry to interrupt, Adam, but like they both die the same way. So the first, so Chop Chopper, Gil, whatever you want to call him, he dies because he's distracted, doesn't notice the threat behind him. Kettlethick dies because he takes too long to do the kill, which is exactly how the city hunter dies. Almost like, like he's playing, playing dead, like year. Harrigan did. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's like it's not necessarily that that's the problem. It's just they blow their load so quickly on it. I hadn't and thought then, of that, but that's a really good observation. Yeah, and it would have been worse as well because with those extra two predators, it would have happened the same thing five minutes later. Yeah, I was watching the movie again last night with my girlfriend, and she was just like, "I wish we could see these predators like fighting together a little bit." And on the um, the slightly extended cut the unrated dvd you do see one little extra scene of them all together when they enter the the chamber that had the plasma casters after they had been taken by the scientists and then they split up um 
And they just kind of split up off screen in the theatrical cut. So I always like that little extra bit where you see Celtic like tell Scar to, to go off and go a different way. Um, but yeah, it did feel like I can see why Predator fans would be a bit irked about that because we hadn't seen three Predators hunting together before either at this point. So to have one of them just be off so quickly and then the other, yeah, he got a full fight, but still just pretty quickly and we're back to one predator again it just feel like it it felt like it it didn't live up to its potential that it had with its setup of multiple predators hunting these aliens in the setting yeah and then predators interestingly does exactly the same thing it's like here's three of them and we're never going to see them working together for a second like they're going to stand in the same scene for one bit and then they're just going to go off and do their own things it's like why are you doing this they have Give that boy cooperation. band moment yeah yeah Sorry, you you oh. nearly got it with the predator. Nearly. Oh, God. But also, <laughs> actually, it's worse because we keep saying, "Okay, two predators die." No, all three predators are dead in ten minutes because Scar gets face hugged. All three predators are gone in the first ten minutes. Basically, he's dead and just yeah. doesn't know it yet. And it's like that's that, that's, uh, that's really well, some, someone involved in the production has said, "Wait until you see the sequel. We're gonna have a whole <laughs> spaceship of them." <laughs> oh, I always thought that was a weird plot point that Scar. I mean, he must have known he was face hugged. He's like, "I'll take care of this on the ship yeah. later, or whatever." No, because they, they get I, amnesia after it. No, I assumed because they put him up on a big pedestal, so I thought, "Oh, clearly it's a sequel. They like a false field has been erected or something. They want to get the Predalien for a hunt." The sequel didn't think of that. The sequel makes it like they're so dumb they didn't check. But I think there's the wriggle room. The sequel didn't think about from, anything. Yeah, I think there's wriggle room to have said, well, that's why they put them up with the red lights on it. Maybe it's it's a containment device. And in fairness, they didn't do that. They just have the chest burst to come out. Well, they, but I think it's, yeah. It's, they, they thought about that, though, because oh, they, they did. didn't. Well, in, in terms of they well. didn't. Yeah, exactly. There you go. They thought about right. it as a we can't have them wearing masks, otherwise they're gonna know there's a jet. Yeah, but the ship would have something on it. Like you, you think you're going to alien planets all the time, no pun intended, and you don't think of them bringing back like diseases or parasites from the local wildlife. The ship should have something, but it's yeah. My thought was okay, they're gonna use the Predalien for the next hunt. Bam, sequel, and um. No, they really were just that dumb. Yeah, they, that that whole the whole teaser of the Pred Alien just really should have been dropped completely. Like it adds nothing to the film. It's nothing but sequel bait. You're killing a third predator. Like, well, he's already dead. So there's there's no point in caring about what's happening now because they've already lost. And it was some good fan service, though. I mean, come on, having no, that. Like, it was it was nice to see it, but it just kind of goes back to how there are ideas in there that should have just been sensibly removed at some point, but they just kind of doggedly held on to them for whatever reason. Yeah, there, there were all sorts of um, rumours before the movie came out that there was going to be an adult Predalien. And uh, I don't know if you remember Patrick Totopoulos. And yes. the, his art, concept art had, had come out and I remember, like, I, I think first part was like a, a bit of a thumbnail, and I immediately posted it, thinking that it's the the you know concept out of the actual pred alien, but it was a pred alien chest burster, uh, and then he quickly removed him from his website, didn't he? Um, but now there were there were rumors though that they were going to do a adult pred alien, but it was a question throughout the entire production was you know in, in loads of the interviews was are we going to see a pred alien because it's of course it's the fucking avp movie it it would i mean don't get me wrong joe i completely agree with you it should have just been cut but it's the avp movie you know it's the first well, time we've finally got them together just imagine the disappointment that you would have had from folk if there was nothing in there at all but okay, here's the other thing. This is what I was thinking about before the the chat came in. In the script, you've always got those two extra, like very, very beginning. You had five predators, you had two extras. One gets face hugged. Have that happen to one, to either Gil or Celtic, so that 
what happens at the end of the script is as Lex and Scar are leaving the pyramid, they find that guy, he gives birth, you get your chest burster moment, you get your pred alien chest burster. Kill it there, move on with your lives. Like you can I, have your cake and eat it. Yeah. And there's so many places like that. And like the, the team up, yeah. which Awful. sucks in the movie, makes no sense in the movie, makes perfect sense in the script. But because they mm -hmm. kept whittling it down and whittling it down, instead of thinking for a second, actually, let's move this from where it is to some other point that could make sense. It's like, nah, it just has to happen at this point and it's going to happen for no reason and we're going to move on with our lives. And it's just frustrating. I'm I never liked it in the script. I always felt it was just as much of a waste as no, the end okay, so, was. Well, no, okay, so in the script, he see uh, when, for anybody who hasn't read the script yet, I don't think you've posted it yet, have you? Well, it was, it was in the novel as well. Well, yes, so I can't remember how the novel does it, but in the script, so Lex jumps over the chasm with Sebastian. She's holding on with one hand. A face hugger comes and attacks. She kills it with one of her climbing spikes. And Scar sees this. So he sees that she does something pretty cool. I, I was thinking the Pred Alien bit specifically there. Sorry, mate. Oh, the... Yeah, I the, know. The, I thought you meant the... I didn't mean the team-up. I meant the, the... I thought the Pred the, the other Pred Alien was wasted in the film. No, it because is. It just... but, no, but I'm, that's what I'm saying. Like, If you have to have that moment, don't use it as some kind of lame cock piece for another film that might not happen. Use it just like at the end. Like, have it like, oh, we're escaping the pyramid. Oh, here's that other predator. Oh, shit, there's a pred alien. I mean, when you're talking about... I, I, I agree with that. I remember watching it. I was thinking, I know there's probably not going to be a pred alien, but maybe a cameo. Maybe they see one on a, a little holographic screen. Yeah, and I just... Like, thinking, oh. Have but, your cake and eat um, it. But the thing about the pred alien, I fully agree, like, yeah, AVP film, some kind of hint of one, but when you find out about how incredibly ridiculously low the budget was, where they couldn't even have more than one cast member holding a flashlight, and credit three. to three. Paul three. Anderson, three. 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 credit to Paul Anderson, he makes it look like the entire team have them all the time, and it's just camera trickery and stuff. He does, he he deserves a lot of credit for making that film look as nearly as good as it does. It has no right to look as good as it did with Completely that kind of agree. Completely agree. Yeah, that is the reason the drop. Yeah, it was. And I'm sure one of the reasons, they probably brought it up in pitch meetings, you know, we should bring it in. And then someone says, yeah, but then we won't have any wardrobe. It'll be something like that. Because if you remember, the reason why the aliens look fleshy is because they were reusing the resurrection costumes. They were, I'm sure they would have loved to have original, non-fleshy looking aliens, but they had to reuse those same molds and stuff. Um, so if they're at that stage, yeah, then we're never going to get a pred alien with a budget consideration like that. But I agree, it's so even in like a flashback hunt or something, they could have put a hint. Well, I'm saying, like you use your same chestburster puppet, you just put it in the pyramid. Don't have it yeah. tease at the end. Yeah, but yeah, and like I, I that, love what I love what you said about have one of the other predators because the unfortunate thematic consequence of having Scar there is that you say like whether he lives or dead at the end, dies at the end, like in battle, that's one thing, but it means that when you look back on it in hindsight as a as a fan, like a young fan, you're like, oh yeah, Scar was cool, he did that kind of pivot, pirouette thing and stabbed the queen gun thing, you realize. He's walking dead. He is dead at that point. He's just, he's just he's just on death row. So all the predators, although it's nice to think of them, well, they they you live by the sword, they die by the sword. Even Scar, no matter what he does, he is essentially dead. And it it puts a downer on things in hindsight. I, I still think they could have had a med pod back at that mothership. I don't know. Oh, definitely. Yeah, they could have fixed him. But then at that point, you're thinking, why get him face hugging in the first place? I think it's kind I, of a great they just analogy wanted the for the rest of the film. Scare. And and whatever we think, I, the chest burst scene we see here with the Pred Alien chest burster is so much better than the one they had in Requiem, which they refilmed for no good reason. They should have just kept this footage, put it in. The Requiem. styles were too it's, different. It was yeah. You yeah. can actually see the chest bursting at the end of AVP. <laughs> yes. <laughs>
And I know that's like the old joke, but they, they literally should look at them side by side. They've intentionally gone and reshot it with their much darker lighting just so it matches the rest of the film. It's like, guys, come on. But it is a perfect analogy for the rest of the film because you're watching this stuff and it's like, oh, okay, that what Scar does is kind of cool, but it doesn't amount to anything because he's already lost. You're watching all this stuff, like that first hour of build-up. Here's an hour to spend with these characters. It doesn't amount to anything because they're dull characters. We don't care about them. We don't care about them dying. Like, even one thing that I think AVP actually does quite well is how it introduces the species. So first we see the predators, then we see the predators kicking people's asses. They wipe out the mercenaries in seconds. And then an alien comes and kills two predators. And that should set the tone for like, wow, aliens are really, really tough. We should be scared any time we see them. But we're not because we don't give a shit what they do to these people because we don't care about these people. Like, all this, these ideas are happening, all these kind of cool bits are happening in service of nothing in the end. It's, that's fundamentally, I think, what the issue is. Like, there's a bunch of cool scenes. There's some nice cinematography, beautiful sets. There's cool beats, all in service of not much. Yep. I mean, you, you can't really argue with that. I mean, character-wise, out of this entire cast, there's probably, like, what, two genuinely interesting characters which is wayland and, and miller yeah and they're, and they're only interesting because they're the only people who want something other than a buttload of cash and to not die miller wants to get back and I show his like kids lex that. i think see lex i think Smart Latham did a good job but yeah. what's her character she is the tough leader at the beginning of the film she's the tough leader at the end of the film she has zero growth she has zero development yeah, she is just no. She's just flat the whole way through. And she doesn't want anything that anybody else doesn't want, and she doesn't necessarily want it in a way that other people don't want. Like, Waylon wants to leave his mark on the world. Miller wants to show his kids he wasn't always so boring. We can relate to this. She's just the tough guy action hero in the middle of an action film. Like, what else is there? Yeah, well, she's a superficial Ripley. Um, on the yes. other hand, um, I was... <laughs> I should have made a note when I was rewatching the do any of us remember actually seeing Wayland having this ultra expensive watch? Because Lance Henriksen's meant to have gone out and spent like half a million dollars on this ultra expensive watch as character uh, like method acting. And I don't remember a single shot where you see it visible. Anybody remember that? No, no okay. nothing. Sorry, Lance, it didn't get shown in the film. I mean, I <laughs> did uh, Yeah. I mean, with a versus movie, it's always tough, right? Because we're there to see the monsters fight each other. Um, but you still need to have good human characters. I liked Alexa Woods as a character. I liked the moment she had with Waylon recounting her past with her father. So I feel like there were some good moments there. Could she have used a bit more development? Yeah, sure. But I don't know. Maybe you could say her arc is just being able to let go more and just go with it because there's that moment she has with Sebastian and Miller as well, where she's going to leave because they're not going to do things by the book. And he's like, well, do we have a better chance of survival with you or with someone else? So at that moment, she just has to kind of trust her instincts as opposed to being like, okay, no, we're doing this my way. We're, we're completely, you know, if you're not going to do this, I'm out of here. So that's a bit of a change for her. I feel like, um, but that happens in the first 20 minutes. That's, yeah, that's true. Like It's done. It's like, I've made a decision. Okay, great. That's my entire growth done. I'm just, I'm sad. Yeah, <laughs> I, th I think they were trying to go somewhere with that when she has to shoot Sebastian. But it didn't really feel like anything she wouldn't have done anyway. And it doesn't um, help that Sebastian is such an uninteresting character. Yeah, he's very cookie cutter, isn't he? The, the, like, every the, the, single story is about somebody who wants something they either get it or they don't on the consequences you get that with wayland yes he's removed from the equation you and i would have liked to see more with way yeah and it's like the problem with alien 3 where the interesting characters get off early and ripley's interesting but there's no equivalent of ripley in Alien 3. And it's a similar thing happening where everyone's treated like red shirts almost. Here. Red yeah. shirts with some extra dialogue, but they're very cookie cutter. Hi, I'm here to die. I'm here to die too. Okay, you know what? We're going to die together. And it, it's 
you don't to read the stuff. plot off the floor and then die. Yes. You don't the, the annoying stuff. thing is that he wasn't written like that. He's actually no. like he's supposed to be this charming kind of guy, and in the script he is, and then it just gets shaved away and shaved away over the drafts. And there's like places where they could have put it, like he's he and Lex walking through the boneyard. That could have been a moment where you could give the guy some characterization. All he does in the film is elicit exposition. Literally everything that guy does in the debriefing scene, he's giving exposition. Talking to Lex, it's almost exposition. Talking in the whale yard, in the boneyard, it's exposition. Like, oh, this used to be a thing. It got, you know, abandoned 100 years ago. It was a big mystery. Oh, I guess we're going to find out the reason for that mystery. It's like, you don't want to have a personality at any point? Like, nah, I'm good. And yeah, there was... For Rob Barber, because I think he, he he's clearly trying to do something. He's clearly trying to act. I think he's like the only person who acts like he's actually giving birth to a chest burster in the film. But he's got nothing to work with. The, 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 the hinging his entire character on attractive Italian men. That's it. That's the role. One of the things I like from the novel, and I don't I don't think it's present really present in any of the scripts that we've seen. I know Mark Sarazini had three that he worked from, so maybe it's one of those ones. But one of the things that he did in the novel was he made Sebastian the you know, I'm a Stargate fan, everybody. He made him Daniel Jackson. You know, he had this crackpot theory about the master civilization, and it was his desire to sort of go and prove that theory that carried him through a bit more in the book that isn't really a it's not present at all in the film and there was one line in one of the scripts about sebastian being the believer and at one point the the verhaden character was an um opposing egyptologist that was aware of it no that's in the book sorry um verhaden was an egyptologist who in the script wasn't a believer and thought the master civilization thing was entire bullshit. I would have liked to have seen that played up a little bit more. Maybe yes, that is a little bit similar to Daniel Jackson, but it would have given him a bit more depth. I suppose, you know, he's there to prove himself. He's there to prove his theory, you know, have some genuine excitement and, and charisma over this adventure part of the film. A lot of the actors tended to talk about how, it was set up as an adventure film. You know, it was Indiana Jones. It was um, not so much horror sci-fi in the lead up. It was fun adventure and then turned into a nightmare along the way. And that, and that could have been a way to really work it up if more of the characters were a bit more thrilled and excited, I suppose. That would have yeah, been another... just there to get their money. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's like Sebastian says straight away, you know, We'll wait for his check to clear. We'll hear what he says and then we'll piss off. Um, yes, I guess, I suppose in that respect, a little bit, yes, his excitement at the possibility of this master culture carries them through a little bit more, but they could have gone so much further with it rather than them all being quite bland. So I do like Sebastian's introduction scene because you do have what you're told as a writer, wherever possible, show, don't tell. And you have a great thing where you, you can tell he wants to make a discovery. And he puts it and he looks through the and all the cameras are there and he finds a Pepsi bottle lid and he shows it to the camera. And without any dialogue, you get what his character is about. He wants to find something. Someone has always been there before he gets there. And it's it's like the the, the most you know contemporary thing you can get, a, a soft drink bottle lid. And then you see on the way to the pyramid, he, it's affected him so much he's using it as a reminder. He's actually made it into a necklace. And I liked that. And unfortunately, that's kind of like where it, it ends for his character's development. But I do really like that was a nice bit of show, don't tell example that the film does. Then the, the film does little things like that really well. But there's, unfortunately, we, we just, it, it it goes right. We now need to go monster fighting, and, and the um, and yeah. the extended cut. You also have the extra scene where um, the manager of of the dig site is threatening to bring in another team because they haven't made progress. So I think that kind of goes into why they were waiting for their 
their check to clear, but then they find out, oh, this discovery is way bigger than whatever we're working on. We're here now, we're doing this. Um, so yeah, I agree that these these characters maybe could have been more developed, but again, there's I think there's a good amount there for the type of movie we're we're going to see here. Um granted, like there was another versus movie that actually a bit of a random tangent here that came out a year prior Freddy versus Jason. Um, uh, I was going to bring that up. And I had only just recently seen that a few years ago for my first time. And I was surprised how damn good it was. Um, yes, it is. It's brilliant. It's much better <laughs> it's than fun. ADP. Yeah. But don't forget that before that you had a lot of Freddy and Jason films that were very kind of, subpar so it was it was a good one for those as opposed to this where you know you had the last predator 2 alien 3 they were better films than the culmination the sum of its parts so i do think it's possible like to do good modern versus movies i mean um many people might not call godzilla versus kong good but it, you can't deny it made a killing at the box office right so I, with these films, yeah, I feel like the studio may be nervous about bringing AVP back because of that negative association with these films. Um, but at the end of the day, I think a lot of fans know the concept of strong from their experiences with it in the expanded universe. So I always have to keep up hope that one day it'll be back. Yeah, and, and uh, needs to be said, Peter Briggs also made a stab at Freddy versus Jason. He was one of the people that that was in development hell. His version was way more hard edged and serious. He brought more about the millennium coming up into it. Um, but he's, he's Alien versus Predator, Freddy versus Jason. Peter Briggs seems to have a lot of bad luck, unfortunately, with these. And uh, AVP was one of those. Well, I think speaking of box office, too, AVP was the most successful film in the franchises at the time. Uh, if you don't adjust for inflation, it grows the most. But if you adjust for inflation, then no. Okay. But also, it was the reason they did PG thirteen was to try and get. Yeah. Tickets. I mean, it, it did well enough that they they fast tracked a sequel and I guess arguably overcompensated for the PG thirteen issue um, with its sequel. But yeah, there's. Speaking of the, uh, before we move on, was there anything else you wanted to say about uh, Freddy versus Jason, D? Oh, no, I, I was just going to say, though, that I, I, um, I don't know if it was the first, you know, Jason film I saw. I know, you know, the vast majority of the films are not very good. All of them, I feel they're not very good. But Freddy versus Jason, what I think might have been one of the, the very first ones I saw. And I think I, I might have seen it before AVP, actually. Oh, because I, yes, I remember the, funnily enough, before AVP came out, I remember people criticizing Freddy vs. Jason for the sort of like blood effects being, you know, looking fake. But and but obviously when AVP came out, Freddy vs. Jason was absolutely wonderful. I mean, I know that, you know, an R rating doesn't guarantee a brilliant film. But come on, to think that Freddy vs. Jason will be PG-13, it, it's just... No, I wouldn't. It, yeah, it it neuters some of the moments, like Rousseau was chest burst. That is pathetic. <laughs> Let's be honest. That is a terribly acted and terribly done moment that just does not equate to any of the experience that John hurt, the Barbara Coles, um, the the dog you know, sort of uh, evoked. And I remember, I remember when we got the news. I remember when we got the news of the PG-13 rating and I was like, oh, it's fine. It's AVP. It's, it's creature goal that we're coming to see. And to some extent, yes, you know, we get plenty of luminescent blood. We get plenty of um, acid blood and everything else, but it just sort of minimizes the the human moments. You know, the the blood on the cloaked wrist blade. That's a cool moment. But then it's just like the the hanging bodies. 
the, the, the skin body, it just doesn't hit the same. And it, it's a super, maybe it's a superficial complaint to complain about the gore, to complain about the rating of that. But it just, yeah, it doesn't hit you the same way. It doesn't impact you the same way. Didn't Paul Anderson... Because they weren't skinned. They were just normal people just hanging upside down. So Didn't Paul Anderson try and sell the movie that way too? He's like, oh, if the blood was red, probably. it would have been rated X or something. Pro- probably. Yeah, I do remember him saying something like that. Yeah, And you know, he's probably not wrong because the majority of the actual... Um, when it's a predator or an alien, but you do see like blades and stuff penetrating flesh. Well, you don't see that as much with the humans. It's like no, a, they always a blade away. and then it's, yeah. I, but, even even when Waylon gets run through, you know, it's a tight on the yes. face. And, and they're all like wearing that. those really puffy jackets. So it's, yeah. it, it, you can hide things. Yeah, I mean, just like Freddy and, and Jason though, there's franchise expectations when you're making this, this sort of movie and even with alien versus predator like some of the comics some of the games were pretty violent at that time so it does unfortunately feel like the movie pulls its punches even the sebastian chest burst which just kind of happens off screen there's no blood on the chest burst or anything when when scar grabs it out of the air so yeah it's it's like the russo chest burst and it's funny because in the uh, they must have heard this criticism of oh yeah they do the because the unrated cut adds all these pretty poor blood effects after the fact i mean there's there's one that's not bad which is where the predator um kills quinn after he slid down the tunnel and the blood splat on the the snow it's just much bigger than it was in the theatrical cut and that looks fine but there's other moments where they just add little bits of cg blood like when he kills Waylon's character and it just does not look good. Even Rosso too, where you see like a, a blood splotch kind of expanding on her her shirt, but it's just really not composited that well. So it was kind of funny that they're like, oh, here's the version you wanted. But if we ever get a 4K, they should do another pass on those blood effects, I think. It always makes me uh, makes me wonder whether, you know, the unrated cut and, and all that CGI blood was in response to the sort of negativity. That, I would have thought, though, that they'd have, you know, produced all the DVD and extras before the movie had come out. It's usually commentaries and everything are recorded well before. So I wasn't really sure whether that were in response to the negativity or not. But no, no I would, it was just very poor, wasn't it, the, the CGI blood? It was. I do remember liking the um, the blood drop following the contours of Lance's um, skin wrinkles it just looks so bad though even on blu-ray when you see it because it just it it looks like it was just thrown in there after the fact i like the fact that the blood bloom on russo's chest does not follow the movement of her shirt yep. in the last yep. couple of frames like you can just say <laughs> if this falls right. off the tracking it's just like someone said that's good enough and called it a day <laughs> it's just for the dvd don't worry about it but i will say we should probably start being positive a little bit because this is an anniversary podcast. The DVD is great as far as all the special features that they give you. At least the um, the when they were doing the Fox Limited Edition DVDs, because I remember they just released like regular widescreen, full screen at first, and it it had some making of stuff, but it wasn't quite as extensive as the one that had that nice case that was like you guys know what I'm talking about. That was like the Fox Collector's Edition. And um, just the menus, going back to old DVDs when they when they had the cool CG animated menus, man, like I miss those days a lot. And revisiting this brought that back. And there were some really great behind the scenes materials for this with just like we saw with Alien Quadrilogy, chronicling the pre-production, production and post-production of the film. And even more than that, uh, the Studio ADI guys have a really good, youtube channel and they've posted a lot of just behind the scenes of the filming of avp so i definitely recommend checking that out there's a lot of their stuff on the dvd and i kind of feel like that's perhaps why there's so much on the dvd is because adi was filming their own stuff anyway i so if we're gonna if we're gonna be positive i i feel like i'm gonna be an outlier here but i actually really like the reused suits of the alien in avp and i actually quite like a lot of the main shots of ian white in the suit in the film you know i think 
you look at you look at the resurrection suit, you look at the AVP suit in the behind the scenes, and yeah, I'm not, I don't think they look particularly great, but Anderson shot them very well in the film. I think I I think the black work the blacky silver kind of look to them worked very well. The palette was very nice, especially with the entire sort of obsidian look to the sets as well. Palette wise, yeah, I really liked them. I thought they worked quite well. And and the gridded um pattern for the primary alien. I thought that was a nice little stroke in terms of individualizing the creatures. I know that's not an opinion that many really have is that the aliens look nice in the film, but I I will give Anderson credit where it's due. I think he shot them well. I yeah, agree. There's some, I... there's some beautiful cinematography in the film. It, like the creatures are well shot. Like even if you don't like the bulky linebacker predators, they're well shot. Like there's some gorgeous, gorgeous shots. And there's a reason why like their designs inspired so much fan art. I think they only really look bulky when it's obviously the suit, uh, the stunt people. And I know um, Alec Gillis complained about it a lot as well on the commentary was him pointing out the, the stunt guys. I think whenever it's Ian White in the suit, and even even with the bulkier look of the armor, you know, because I completely understand the logic that they were going for, you know, um, same for like all the upgraded in quotation marks, the upgraded weaponry, you take an elephant gun to hunt an elephant. I, the logic is very logical. But I think when it is Ian, he does not look anywhere near as... The profile doesn't look unathletic. You know, it still looks like a predator. Yes, there's more to him, but he's still... That whole profile, that whole body length, that all works well for me. Yeah, I remember there was a concerning picture because the movie novelization came out before the movie, I think by a month. So I read it before the movie came out. Yeah, it was um, in July. That was, that was something else we should talk about as well. It was one of those old novelizations that had this little middle part that would show like pictures from, from the movie. And one of them was a full body shot of the Predator right here. And it is that squat kind of shorter stunt performer. So it just did not look quite right and i always kind of was was trying to justify it like well they're a bit more like proportionally stylized in the games maybe they're going for that or whatever but yeah the suit definitely worked better on a frame like like Ian's. but even then this was part of paul anderson's direction he wanted the football linebacker kind of like predators and it becomes more apparent when you watch avpr and you see that old armor in, in the opening scene, you see that old armor on the new suits and it, the armor looks kind of big for those predators bodies in that one. Um, it, I thought it was a good mix of approaches as well. Technologies, you know, the, this was an era when we started to become concerned about the direction we were taking with CG becoming very prominent. And AVP is one of those films that, really mixes the practical the digital the miniature very very well i think it holds up quite well to this day still well everybody back then was still thinking of the scorpion king i've been burned in their memory as that thing uh, i i think one thing i think most people agree that this film does really well is the set design and although i think some of the architecture looks um a little too clean cut, but I think that's the point. It's not meant to be humans carved it. Probably the predators did and they gave it to humans to put together. Um, there's so much beautiful stuff in that pyramid. Even like the um, the predator language has been carved in. It's like raised out of the stone. So when you have these camera shots down these um, corridors, it's like the predator writing creates its own art because the shadows sort of raised from those parts um i do really love the reconfiguration pyramid how that is executed um but yeah the set design for that film is not a fan of how they redesigned the predator ship have we discussed that infinite and but i love the uh, the pyramid stuff it's really well done the reconfiguring i think was one of the 
films more interesting ideas and you know we sort of saw it get used in like avp 2010 you know adam they they use that to good effect in the games and i think we were talking off the air before before um about this you know but a point in the middle of the film it stops happening it stops being relevant it was a chance to break the characters up and give them breathing room to deliver exposition and stuff like that but as a concept it's it's really interesting i just wish they'd followed through with it a bit more well it's it's an excuse to basically do the indiana jones thing let me grab my hat thing but do it again and again and again basically but i did love that you could this whole thing was set up for predators so predators want to give themselves an extra challenge so the entire thing does this kind of hellraiser cube thing it gives the predators a challenge the the disappointing part of it is that it never seems to give them a challenge even right at the end when scar tosses the bomb in it's like they run down a corridor and they're out in the open and it destroys that whole yeah thing. That, that was a very poor moment yes and it, there's parts in it where i think paul anderson he was just in the zone and he thought this is gonna go really well it looks really well but when you edit it all together it's like the the slow motion face saga shots which i like but a lot of people thought looked a bit cheesy and the thing where lex and scar they're running in slow motion and things like that enough soft focus where she even says on the commentary said a lot of my friends look like we're about to kiss and anderson is genuinely mystified but to us as audiences we're like yeah it does look really weird dude but you can tell he was in the zone he was just being like, this looks good as an individual shot instead of it being more cohesive. It was kind of a lingering moment. It's like, okay, I, why are they staring at each other for this long? <laughs> that, I think that was a subconscious thing because, I mean, the romanticization of the design was very intentional. You know, that's what ADI had said that Anderson had said of wanting like the longer dreadlocks and the teeth was to make it more human. He wanted him to be the version of Fabian. Yeah, and less slime. Although, to be fair, I had always had a lingering memory of the Predators being a bit too fake looking. And every time I've revisited it recently, I'm like, no, they're still moist. The Predator's face is still moist. It's fine. I think, I think my problem tends to come from the rest of the skin. It you lose a lot of the detail. You lose a lot of the paint detail and the pattern on the skin. So it has this very sort of flat, beige, um, orangey kind of look to them, to the stomach, to the arms and stuff like that. And I think that's where my only real problem with that appearance is uh, with the Predators. They took off the stomach hairs. If you look at the first Predator, he's got like little hairs on his stomach and his back and they didn't put them on. So when Celtic's got his you know, kid off and it's like, hey, look at me, I'm I'm topless. It's like that this looks like rubber. But in in the some of the behind the scenes you still see there's there is skin patterning painted on there. There is detail to it, even if it you know does lose the hair. Um but it's just not apparent in the film. Yeah, yeah but the hair also gets have... to break it up. I don't think City Hunter had the stomach hair either. No, he doesn't have it. I think he's got the back hair though. They were gonna have that scene where they got out of cryo tubes and they were fully naked and I, I don't know if they were going to be covered in something but I do remember the predator drop into slime. Yeah, I, I do remember the Predator fandom had a big issue with the fact that they gave the upper teeth, they just made them four instead of two like in the it was such a big like you had so much anger, oh they don't it's going to look so fake. It wasn't just um, the extra teeth, it was the fact that the mouth closed yeah, I was going to say that is a thing that's retained ever since then. There's been this whole thing they call them like broken jaw predators because it just doesn't close like the original. That you cannot physically make those jaws mandibles. Well, that's the mandibles close up. Yeah, no, the, the the mouth and the mandibles they change. But the thing about that, that's not even true because scars actually could. His was so flexible that his mouth actually could mm-hmm. close up and sculpted to be closed. Mm-hmm. And in behind the scene shot, you can see like the the stunt mask has closed mandibles. They just didn't do it for some reason. Yeah. And then decided never to do it again. Yeah. 
And when you I, said uh, earlier about the queen, um, you're right. She she moves beautifully, but there is that. It does come up on the forum sometimes. There is this difference between the way the queen works in this, which you know she is so dynamic. She's beautifully dynamic, but she does move like a T Rex, as opposed to James Cameron's version where she did move more insect-like, which is interesting because James Cameron, apparently, he regards this as a guilty pleasure movie. So he must approve of it, I guess. Yeah, but we, we can never take James, Cameron, James Cameron's uh, opinions on anything, though. Yeah. Not with all the ter- all Genesis, right? With, yeah, with and all Dark the Terminator Fate. praise. Yeah. yeah, with him slagging off Alien 3 and then pulling an Alien 3 at the start of Dark Fate. We can't take him at face value. Well, this is the film. If you remember, he was in the moment of with um, Ridley Scott, Sigourney Weaver. He was writing an Alien Five, and then he heard. Well, I don't know if it ever went that making. far. And that's they, what they, he they said. Were... He said they. He heard they were making AVB, and then he just stopped writing it. But then he said he watched it, and he actually wishes he hadn't stopped writing it because he turned out to be yeah, I, I like this. It's a guilty pleasure film. To agree with you on a couple of your earlier points, Aaron, as far as the effects go, yeah, I feel like this was kind of in that early 2000s era where you just had some movies. I kind of grouped Jurassic Park 3 along with this that just had really strong practical and CG work working together in tandem and miniature work as well. Even things like the the ship, the Pipper Maru, the icebreaker, um, having the motion control shot of the helicopter miniature flying towards that actual ship um so i the love other that shot like... and i'm confused that paul anderson hates it oh does he i he, haven't he seen met, that commentary he calls for it a while. Out specifically in the commentary he's like i was never happy with this shot sorry to interrupt but it's like that one memory sticks in my mind because it's actually my favorite shot in the film i think it looks quite nice it's a good shot and he hates oh, it he loved it he, he, no, he, he was whining about the motion, motion wasn't it yeah yeah he says the motion of the helicopter is not right i was like it's cool it kind of sweeps oh. up it looks nice the the one shot I love almost the most in like aside from when Grid is sc- standing on that pile of skulls, which is an awesome moment. Yeah, just, that's that's good. Um, the the really get everyone seems to think this was the moment that almost freaked them out in a way. Um, it's the moment where the the Wayland satellite comes into view and it looks just like a queen, but because it's so surrounded in that kind of space dust fog thing it, it looks so beautifully it does fool you for a moment but it's so well done that shot of the satellite i think that's a john bruno in in the commentary was talking about it trying to evoke specifically the end of aliens where the queen's coming out of the airlock you know she's falling into space and it feels kind of like a silly concept to trying to mislead the audience that doesn't really amount to anything can't amount to anything we all knew well ahead of time that this was nothing to do with the future i I do think it's a nice shot though i very much enjoy the what was it the very first shot though the theatrical court yes yeah so from that but because you don't know if they're going to do because a lot of us you know you had the comics and stuff you you don't know if it's going to start out with the predators on another planet or something, it could have been something like that. I think that's what they were going for. Uh, well, the and, shot and... that does evoke the queen tumbling is when she's going through the water, which that, is another that, lovely shot. Yeah, it is. That's beautifully rendered, but that, that is clearly meant to look like she's coming out of the, the airlock and going into space. And another strong moment in terms of CG working with practical is just this practical miniature queen when she's freed. It's just a bunch of CG aliens crawling up on her body. And there's there's other effects where like they show their age, the compositing doesn't work as well. Like there's one particular one, uh, Scar sets the bomb, and then he and Lex are starting to run, and you see this just mirrored hallway, and you see them kind of getting larger in perspective, and it just doesn't quite look right. But there's there's a lot of other effect shots I feel like where everything's just firing in all cylinders, and it still holds up to this day. I quite liked the CG aliens in the in avp you know there was a lot of good motion from them especially from the shot that you were just talking about adam you know climbing on the queen that is that's a nice miniature queen uh, i think it was like 15 feet long or something like that um with these very nice fluid aliens 
um, on them. I, I always found it to be the flames in that miniature set that stuck out to me because uh, they, they were, a, you know, a, a Adam in later with CG kind of thing. And that's the only bit that ever really makes me go. Mm. And we hadn't seen aliens move like this in CG too much. I mean, there was a few CG shots in Resurrection, but it yeah, was Resurrection was where like... it's crawling in the, um, the escape pod, I think is, yeah. is a good example yeah. of that. I think the it sounds so trivial, but the I'm assuming it's animatronics. It looked like animatronics. The if it is, it's the shot I love the most. And you see it used a number of times. It's when you see the queen's hands, and she just stop, especially when she's waking yeah, up. That's, that's, that's and the full size. She, she does the the kind of flexing of the joints of the hand. It just looks so beautifully done. That that's one of those moments where you can almost buy she's a living creature in that. But I, I do love that hand flex that, that shot that she well, does. When I was talk, talking about like having seen the film the second time, like a friend was there laughing. That's the shot that got him. Because you can see her only one set of knuckles moves, her fingers don't bend. And he just would not stop laughing at it. <laughs> And so for the rest of the film, like half of the special effects, you just keep laughing at, which I partly I think is just trying to be edgy. But that was the one I was like, why are you laughing at that shot? And he's like, because you can tell her fingers aren't moving. Only like, I, I they only flex the walls. <laughs> I, know, see, I like the shot. I, I, I don't have any problems with it, but it just it sticks in my memory. That, that was the one that just started him sniggering throughout the entire film. Yeah, yeah. It's been mentioned previously, but we haven't really talked about it. And this this is probably my biggest hate of the film, actually. The team up. Oh, good. We're going to start getting negative. <laughs> no. <laughs> Again. <laughs> I, we, need, we need to talk the team up because it's the thing that irks me the most in the film. Because I do not think she fucking deserves any of the respect that he gives her in the theatrical version of the film. And it's it, it annoys me because it's such a staple... It's such a staple part of the franchise, and I fucking hate it that it is a staple part of the franchise because it's done so poorly so often, and it never it never ceases to set my face my facial muscles muscles twitching when it happens when I'm watching the films because it's just a oh shit okay okay it's done it's done there you go I'll build your suit of armor so through. I'm. I'm going to push back on this one a little bit. So the film obviously shares things in common with the comics, right? Even the fact that the queen is restrained and, and laying eggs and the end, you have the whole marking stuff and, and the team up. There's something from that original comic um, with uh, Machiko Noguchi. So I feel like, you know, you had that moment you mentioned from the script, Joe, where uh, she gets the face hugger with her, ice axe and that kind of impresses scar and that's part of the reason for the team up i feel like we still kind of get that where she's giving him his gun back and if it would have just been that he probably just would have left right but an alien kind of sneaks up on him pushes him over and she grabs the spear and reacts and and kills it and i think at that point he's like okay well let's let's see what you can do i'll make you a spear i'll make you the shield and you can tag along and we'll see what happens so at that point i feel like he's just kind of curious and i feel like and again going to the extended cut there's a scene where he kind of taunts her by stabbing this exposed brain of the xenomorph to to do a jump scare with the the um inner jaw shooting out at her so he's just kind of amused at this point i feel and he wants to see if she'll survive and that's kind of how i took it as and through them escaping the pyramid um he he does come to respect her at that point and that's why he ultimately bloods her um so yeah i honestly never had a problem with it i know everyone points to those shots of the slow-mo them running with the fire behind them whatever like i can chuckle at it sure but it wasn't something i found like super offensive or anything but the bits at the end of the movie where you do see her kill the alien with the pin gun you know when she does show her chops by taking out Sebastian, you know those are those are good moments. They're earned moments, but they come after the fact. They come after she yeah. looks out with the alien. Because let's be honest, it's it's the convenience of the the spear, 
she can brace it against the wall, and it's the alien's momentum doing all the. I mean, the alien work. basically kills itself. Yeah. Yeah. It is not an alien itself. suicides itself. Yeah. Yes, but all okay. Actually, so first draft of the script. I'm going to have finished this rant that I started before. It's not just that one scene. When they team up, she doesn't have the gun to give him. So he is about to attack her. The alien knocks him down. She grabs the spear, but another alien attacks him. So he gets beaten up. She kills that other alien. Then the other aliens all swarm them. And so he's got no gun to start shooting them. She just killed two aliens now. He closes a secret door, gives her some armor, opens the door back up. They kill a couple more aliens. Then they run off. Like, it's a moment of, like, actual desperation where he's screwed because he can't just blow these aliens to pieces. And then, when they get their guns later, he gives her one of them in a handheld mode, like in AVP Requiem, and she's even more useful. They're now yep. both running around with shoulder cannons, like, blasting aliens left and right. I mean, and but yet, then you would have had fans complaining that she kills two aliens right off the bat. Oh, no, no, she kills even... I think she kills two more aliens with the spear and a knife like it i i don't like that part but it makes sense in it makes more sense in the story that he'd be that desperate yeah. and this is what i also was talking about earlier like because this is a fixed point it's like no no this team up has to happen here even though it no longer makes any sense to happen here because he's got the gun what does he need her for he can just blast aliens now i would have just moved the team up happening to when they're at the ice grotto as they're about to go up the tunnel like, they go their separate ways through the thing. Maybe he sees her shoot Sebastian. They're both about to escape. Alien drops down on him. She blows his head off. It's like, I got this escape route. He's like, cool, I need to get out of here. I'm I'm losing a lot of blood. Yeah, That's more of a marriage up. of convenience. Exactly. Yeah. And then they have to team up to fight the Queen. Yeah. And so then I, he blows I her think, after the Queen. I, I think it would have been cool if you just had... You need more of the Predator's arrogance because it got a little too humanized in this. Though it might have been nice if we had a moment where something happens with an alien and Lex realizes he just used her as bait. Something like that where it's clear he's using her as a tool rather than yes. with best bosom buddies. Because I think that's where a lot of the kind of pushback from the community, and it's, you know, it's justified in some ways. Um, because they, it's like they become a little too friendly, a little too fast, and she hasn't quite earned it. And also, the Predator hasn't earned it with her. Like, there should have been a moment, like, she, just, she realizes, yeah, one of them's got a, a human skull or something. Something like that. Because this isn't a human, this is an extraterrestrial, and it's extraterrestrial that's very suited and has probably experienced hunting and killing humans. I he's, he's looking at her as just another potential trophy. But um, yeah, it's just those when it happens, how it happens, if it had happened mm -hmm. later, maybe not as much of a problem. Their willingness to go and give the predators the casters back is also one of those ones that I'm, I'm not convinced about. You know, literally two minutes ago, this guy just tried to throw a shuriken at you and take you out. He just killed Wayland. You know, he's just chased you through here. And yes, because and it's the we, same predator. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and yes, because we've established that there's some of the some other scary monsters in here as well. This one that just immediately nearly took you guys out is the preferred one. Yes, I understand. Enemy of my enemy is my friend, but at that point, the aliens weren't hadn't been involved with Sebastian or Lex at all, if I remember rightly. Because the movie had to happen. But it's still annoying. It's no, fucking annoying. No, 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 it is. And this is exactly what I mean. Like all the potential from that first draft is lost because of these like tiny, tiny changes that build up to bullshit happening because we've got yeah. these fixed points in the story that we still have to hit, but we no longer have all the build up that would have been a payoff which is why it feels like a bunch of disconnected ideas, like Eric was saying before. It feels like throwing spaghetti at the wall. Because everything that made it gel together got stripped out, but instead of taking it apart and rebuilding it with the resources that they needed to make it with, they just kept trying to fit round pegs into square holes. 
And I'm not sure why a lot of those cuts were made as well, as well you know. I don't... Like, I understand things like Cambodia going. Money. You know, that is that is a money thing. But, like, the other bits and pieces... No, like, let's hang up the side, kill the face. Okay, that's a big act. I suppose that would have been special effects. Effects. Yeah. Um, more creature fights, that's special effect. Like, even the alien that Scar kills before we get the exposition dump about, like, you know, the past about what the whole hunt and ritual is about. That was supposed to be a bigger fight. He was supposed to cut the alien's arm off and then kill the alien. And it got cut down to like this psh, one quick move, it's dead. It's all just tiny, tiny cost-saving measures that build up to a film that doesn't amount to much. As far as the Cambodia opening as well, Aaron, I remember you did a video kind of going through that whole sequence that wasn't shot and it's also in the novelization but yeah i do feel it would have been a bit strange to have flashback sequence flashback sequence and now we're in the movie uh but i remember reading that part in the novelization like oh we're finally going to see aliens in the jungle too like this is crazy and uh you know of course like you said budgetary reasons didn't happen um but yeah we do get that extra the one flashback again in the extended cut where we see the whaling station and have that brief little moment with the one survivor and i think that's longer in the book as well that's it is, it is but that that was sarazini padding that out in the script it's about that condensed mm. and i i don't really like the prologue i'll be honest i liked the cambodia one um because even the script there was a little bit more to it uh, but that eventually as joe says you know that kept getting pared down the first the first draft version of it is a lot longer than it is in the interim draft. Um, it's like three and a half pages in the first one, or maybe four. Yeah. Pages in a bit. It's it's a really long sequence. And then I think it's down to like a page and a half in the interim draft, and I think that's what the Whaling Station one is in the September draft as well. It's about a page and a half. And it, it's just too fast. It's too condensed. It's too quick. And it... It's not satisfying. I I understand, like Cameron, no, not Cameron, uh, Anderson's script makes a lot of points throughout of brief glimpses. You know, it's it's building anticipation. It's it's building um, the mystery around the design. And I think at that point, it just doesn't work. It doesn't matter. Y yes, in regard, it it might work in in terms of. I'm anticipating this clash. I'm anticipating finally seeing them smash into each other and cut each other up and see the strengths of each other at play against each other. But it just it never worked for me in the actual finished version of the film. Oh, and yeah. can I also, in, in regards to Anderson's script while I'm talking about it, how he made liberal use of the phrase humanoid but not human that was in there a yeah. hell of a lot describing aliens and predators and in the book as well it shows up in the novel and i i think you you hit upon the the issue it's it's not a film which i mean for some people it does but it doesn't feel satisfying because it is like it it feels a little rushed um and that is to its detriment but as we were saying earlier it's not a bad movie you can have fun with it you can sit down especially if you've never seen an alien or predator film before and you can have fun with it it's it's there's a lot of good nice shots and that in the same way as there are with you know a, a jason Bourne or whatever um does it necessarily stand up to scrutiny, especially if you're a pre-existing fan? Not necessarily. We haven't even touched on like the gestation time for the chestbursters. That was a big bone of contention in the early aftermath. To the point where people started making bullshit up. Yes, yes. The whole um, she had her thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was never a thing. Um, but. Uh, a fun little movie isn't necessarily um, you know, a good movie. It's a generic alien film, generic predator film, but it's a fun film on its own. Like we've said before on Prometheus, 
Prometheus is not a great alien movie, but it's it's on its own. It's an okay kind of interesting movie. But once you make it part of the series, then yeah, it's it, it has issues, structural issues. That's what you get here. But is it a fun movie to sit down and watch, be entertained, just have a drink or whatever? Yes, but it's it does have these issues from awareness of what's gone before it. That's there are issues with it. That's the thing. The movie is just fun and for a first outing between these two like i know it's cliche to say oh it could have been worse but i mean it it could have maybe uh but you i've seen a few articles in recent years that are like avp is an underrated film uh so i think it just it does have a lot going for it and yeah it's easy as fans to see those flaws they become pretty apparent and to to think oh this could have done been done better or or that but overall for me it was just a very effective film in what it was trying to do yeah there was there was some big points of personal disappointment for me as well the rating that that was a big one for me because that definitely felt off um but overall i feel like it it does more right than it does wrong and i get that's not that's maybe not a majority opinion but um for me, it just overall works. One of the things that I would like to highlight, one of the things where I think it does right, is as much as most of us, the majority of us, wanted it in space, we wanted it sat within the Aliens timeline, I think for the restrictions, because this was John Davis, this was the Predator producer, wanting it set on Earth, I think Anderson did a very good job of choosing antarctica you know if you are going to do if you are forced to do uh, an earthbound setting one of the remote areas one where you've got perpetual darkness or twilight at you know specific times of the year just this endless field of ice this endless sort of particle uh, effect to the you know the the far distance he does a great job at making it feel isolated and i think to some extent Yes, you could have done that exact same kind of thing on another planet somewhere. But again, to to the producer, to the people bankrolling it, to appeal to that desire from them, I think he did it in a very smart way. And I very much enjoy the Antarctica setting. Well, Anderson seems to have a lot of luck with pitches. From what I remember, this was pitched. And once you've watched it you can go oh yeah i can see this i think this was pitched as jaws meets the thing now hollywood loves what's called high concept scripts high concept means can you explain the entire thing in one sentence jaws meets the thing and yes um he's chosen it for the isolation of the thing but he forgets but what made the thing work was you had a hell of a lot of tension. You don't get the tension so much in this. You get the cl- the um, confrontations, which are more like a worldwide wrestling match. They feel more like wrestling matches. They It doesn't feel like a hunt. It doesn't feel like you're being stalked. It doesn't feel like an incoming swarm. It just feels like a full-on Hollywood action thing. And by doing that, it removes what made the thing work and Jaws work. So he pitched it like that. I could, again, there are moments in this film where you can see glimmers of what Anderson was going for, and it could have been so much better, and it should have been so much better, but they went that other way with it. And I think because of that, it didn't live up to the premise of how it was pitched with the isolation. But if you're going to put it anywhere, yeah, Antarctica, you could put it under sea. Um, you could put in a, a, a sealed safari location, but there is no reason why they couldn't have just had like a ramshackle colony and just said, oh yeah, it's on another planet. Who's to know? They would just need, especially if most of it's set in a pyramid anyway. So they could have just said, yeah, what's this? Oh yeah, this this colony, they found a pyramid. Yeah, let's just go straight to the pyramid. You don't need modern day architecture at that point. And at that point, you could have gone back to the alien with the derelict kind of formula. 
So just just to that point quickly as well, you know, Anderson very much is the businessman. You know, he he went in, he pitched a budget. He went in with the considerations of what he could do for his money. He went in with that fantastic fucking artwork from Patrick Totopoulos um, to highlight the, you know, the 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 key points, the money the money shots of the film. Like, and he's... Like, that's what George Lucas did with Star Wars. He took concept art. And J. Michael Straczynski with Babylon 5, he took concept art. It's easier to sell something when you've got visuals like that. Hi. And we're, we've just lost Sil. Um, he's disappeared because it's very late Australia time. Um, but I think we're probably about ready to wrap up anyway, aren't we? A couple last little bits I wanted to mention. Um, there are also, speaking of odd similarities, um, there are odd similarities between this and Resident Evil. Uh, the, the Anderson Resident Evil. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call them odd similarities. Yeah, I guess they are very intentional similarities. Reuse. You have all these cuts to the holographic map, where yes. we have that in Resident Evil as well. Red where Queen we'll see where they are with the map. You have the Queen. I did. I did the like the map structure. I liked the maps in AVP. It, it, I don't think it's something we'd seen the Predators use you uh, holographic technology previously but i i thought it looked nice and there was some good um some good match cuts it uh, looked nice i'm not sure it made sense because they're seeing everything in heat it would have been better if it had come up on their head up displays rather than as a physical thing coming out of their wrists i thought but I think Anderson does have a weird thing about holographic maps in a lot of his <laughs> films. Especially the Resident Evil ones. Yeah. Uh, Colin Salmon's in both of them. Uh, he gets diced in both of them by lasers in Resident Evil and by Annette in this one. I was um, expecting to see Sean Pertwee. He has certain people he works with, yeah. And wasn't Mila Jovovich supposed to star in this until production ramped up on it, it was uh, michelle TV. it was michelle rodriguez and if you remember there's one bit of concept art where i think she's been chased by a queen and it looks like michelle rodriguez as well i had not heard of that before i thought yes. it was always mila jovovich yeah she might have been as well i think he, they were married at that point but um rodriguez was one of the early considerations for lex i, I think she would have done well with it too but also the um, the score was something I wanted to bring up that we didn't really talk about by Harold Kloiser, I believe. Um, there are some tracks there, especially the the slower ambient tracks that I really appreciate. I got to say, even back then, I didn't think the score felt very Alien or Predator. Um, no, but, but it worked. But it worked for the movie. And then we got a much more Alien and Predator sounding score with, with the next one. Right, Tyler, yeah. Yeah, the the, the track which works be- and it's part of what makes it such a great little scene is History of the World. And that's yeah. the one that plays over the flashback scene. That is a really beautiful piece of music. It's one I use a lot for writing inspiration, History of the World. The uh, AVP has its own musical identity. You know, a lot of Predator uses very similar tribal kind of things. And there is a theme that carries, you know, a motif that carries throughout all the soundtracks now. I don't mind that. Things are allowed themes. Things are allowed motifs that carry throughout the series. It, it gives uh, an identity, a, um, a consistency throughout the entire thing. And I very much enjoy Brian Tyler's score for AVPR, but it is very much a best of it's a it's a hits album, the greatest hits album. But Clauser's closes thing for AVP is probably one of the more unique uh, scores in the franchise. Prometheus as well, maybe. And it works within the context of itself. Like I always had a huge, huge soft spot for Down the Tunnel. You know, you don't hear anything like that in any of the other films. And I think it's kind of more for this indiana jones action adventure kind of take that they were attempting to go for with a kind of dark tomb raider yeah i enjoy it I, I i've always enjoyed the score ever since the film came out i think it was the first soundtrack i actually brought from the film uh, from any of the alien and predator films i think that also dropped before the movie came out because i remember listening to that before the movie which i, I probably wouldn't do these days but 
that's something else you reminded me about the novel. So yes, that came out in July, uh, a full month before the film came out. And I remember waking up at like three or 4 AM in the morning before school and just sitting there and reading it through for three or four hours before I had to get ready for school, then coming back home and finishing it off. Um, when I got home, there's, there's not a few books that I tend to beast through in a day or two anymore. Um, Aliens Phalanx, I did it in. Cold Forge, I think I did it in. Um, the Lost Fleet, the newer Lost Fleet stuff, I'll read over a weekend, whereas normally it takes me a week to read through things. And I think a lot of that was the excitement of, again, the pre-release of Alien and me just sitting there and beasting through it all that time. I remember that being... An odd thing to happen a whole month before the film came out because, yes, it fucking spoiled the entire film. You know, yes, it's very different. There are, uh, The novel is a mixture of three different drafts of the script <laughs> for a start. You know, that's why you have these two prologue scenes and there's whole circumstances around why it's not as accurate to the shooting draft. And that's, unfortunately, things like Death in the Families for Mark Serezini, and then wanting things done in eight hours and bits and pieces like that. Uh, Joe and I actually did a joint interview with him seven years ago that's on the website, which details some of that kind of stuff. He was actually offered a the novel for AVP Requiem. They asked him to come and write a novel for AVP Requiem, but he turned it down because they wanted it in like a week or something stupid like that. Um but that's an interesting that's an interesting interview that I recommend people go and have a look at. That's in our interview section. That seems to be a project which suffered from tight shooting schedules all round. Requiem. Well, remember you've been saying how low of a budget AVP's been made on. You know, Requiem was two thirds of that, I believe. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Fuck Requiem. Oh, come on now. I, I know he hasn't been <laughs> biting his tongue every time. I, I've been seeing his heartbreak every time somebody says something bad about that oh. film. Any any other points or notes that people want to hit? I do think whether or not you like this film, it 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 has kind of gained a cult following, I think, among oh, fans. You would, yeah. I would, I would even sure, say that. Right? I would even say well, actually, that. You know what we need to do? We need to read some of the comments that people left us on social media. Okay, we'll get there. But to wrap some up, some of those you can't read. <laughs> I feel like there's some some things that it affected the franchise going forward. You know, the the design aspects we got in some of the expanded universe for even the AVP game in 2010. You know, being able to explore. The uh, p- another pyramid finally was really cool. The comics at the time we had these two kind of um, contained graphic novels. I kind of think of this as like Paul Anderson's AVP trilogy, right? Because these two feel like they're in the future. I'm mm-hmm. holding up uh, Thrill of the Hunt and Civilized Beasts, and they feel like a logical kind of continuation to AVP. Civilized Beasts was a genuinely good little digest. I remember Thrill of the Hunt being a bit shit. Well, okay, a bit okay. It was okay. But Civilized Beast, it was like a two, three, four year gap between the publications of them both. But Civilized Beast was actually very good. You know what? I might reread that tonight. And you see people like clamoring for AVP DLC for games like Predator uh, Hunting Grounds. You see companies like Prime One making multi thousand dollar expensive statues for avp still 20 years later so the film i think it is fondly remembered by a lot of people regardless of whatever nitpicks we have or if it could have been this if it could have done that uh i would say that that it has cult status maybe not as high of cult status as some other films sure whatever alien 3 cult status wasn't well liked when it came out right so i feel like this is kind of in a similar vein and the spear was in um Predator. Lex yeah, that, that, that doesn't mean anything, though, the Predator. Stuff. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes. We were talking about impact yeah, going no. forward. Yeah. I mean, you've also... I, I don't want to... I don't want to seem like Adam's overselling it there, but the whole aesthetic influence in later things is just... It's just kind of the way that franchises go. You know, the new stuff references 
the not quite as old but newer stuff. That's why you get things like the cover art at the time. You know, that uh, cover art for the novels, the DH Press novels, they made a lot of use of the AVP Predators. That was because of the availability of the reference material. You know, it's not... I don't. I don't think that kind of prevalence necessarily equates to impact or significance of the things. Not to not to piss on your fucking apple or anything, Adam. But I, I just, I just wanted to to point that out. But you know, looking through some of these comments on socials, there is a lot of positivity towards the film. So I'm reading from our Twitter thread at the minute. Um, Fantameron says this movie checks all the right boxes, merges two top movie, uh, top monster movies, excellent writing and storytelling, perfectly made film with right conflict resolution, character development, etc. Inclusive as the main protagonist is a powerful and beautiful black woman, uh, actress Sana Latham. Obviously, some of we might disagree with some of the comments about the character development and the writing uh, there. Um, but then, you know, that's positivity there. Mr. Loco says, I liked it when it came out and I still like it today. Although I don't watch the theatrical cut, I watch the unrated cut, which is much better. While the movie isn't the best in either franchise, I still, I feel it's still delivered and I've watched it more times than I can count. Um, what we got? Honestly, it says Batfleck DCEU. Honestly, I really like the movie. The setting and premise was interesting. The Xenos were great. The Predators were a bit weaker, especially compared to the Wolf in the sequel. My gripe, our characters and PG-13 rating. The franchise was always rated R, and I don't understand the decision. Uh, Edgar Sola says, a fun film, but I would have preferred that all the action took place on another planet other than Earth, in a remote colony, for example. Honestly speaking, nothing would have changed in the plot if they changed the name of the planet, which is fair. There are, uh, here's another one, Glenn Hayes, an imperfect masterpiece, in my opinion, really solid human cast, which I will agree with. You know, we might have slated some of, no, slated some, the, not the right word. We might have complained and criticised some of the characters. The cast was actually quite good. You know, it had Ewan Bremner, Bremner in it, who was um, Scott, a Ridley Scott pedigree, had been in... Um, Black Hawk Down. Black Hawk Down, and had a very significant... Well, actually, I don't know if it's a significant role. I've never seen the film, but had um, had a part in Train Spotting, you know, which was a very big, well, cult film, perhaps a very significant yeah, film. It, it did lead to some AVP memes along those lines with drugs and stuff back then. Yeah, because it was so, so definitely, definitely a good cast, and we probably should have talked about it a bit more. Um, Glenn Hayes continues great additions to the law, but the unmasked design for Scar was pretty bad without the X formation of the mandible and the bulkier predator suits take away from the grace and obvious agility Yaucha are known for. So there's, there's a lot of you know, while this positivity, with that Steve Perry Yaucha, yeah, isn't it? Uh, yeah. yeah, I can't help it. I default to Yaucha. Yeah, um, so there, I mean, there's certainly positivity, but it's very leveled positivity yes. it, it's good but and there are some people who fucking hate it here um or well, lazaro rubio says it still sucks 20 years later <laughs> this movie movie was supposed to be on the first two games and on the dark horse comics of the same name it was not well to be fair that was never announced or said um the whole premise behind the alien saga and this is a very valid point here the whole premise behind the state alien saga is presenting a single xeno from making it to earth and in these films we have a lot more than just one xeno already on earth we have two queens for pete's sake i don't know where he's getting two from there but that's a, that's an entirely fair point and that was something a lot of people uh complained about at the time um and I've just noticed Adam says he needs to. We need to wrap up here for him as well, so uh, we can we can start just, to... just before we do. I I did mention to say one of the things I think that gets people's backs up about that first Predator death. No, it was the second. No, the first one, because it was Chopper, and he came across with these massive saw yeah, things. So anything. you have a yeah, you have a Predator. It's new. Wow, let's see that in action. 
you never see it in that. It's like a guy turning up to a race in a big like Ferrari and a bomb takes him out before the car does what it's designed to do. So <laughs> I think that's, that's part fair. of why that has some, no pun intended, but bad blood. Yeah. Okay. Darkness, have you got any last words? Yeah, I mean, I, I think given how difficult it is to sort of do a solo Alien and Predator film that's, you know, decent, it was always going to be difficult to do an AVP film that was going to please everybody. So, and I guess the saying is, um, time heals old wounds. So it's definitely not as bad as um, as it was. And there is a lot of good elements in AVP, like there is in Requiem as well. But um, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's always going to bring back a lot of bad memories for me. But it's, um, and like I said, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd still like a new AVP film, you know, set in the future and, and what have you. And I'd, I'd still have hope for that. Um, but I just think it's going to be uh, very, very hard to sort of convince Disney or Fox or whatever to, to they just seem to sort of like see AVP as a joke. Um, and I wish mm-hmm. they'd, I wish they'd sort of do something with the license instead of it just, you know. I mean, the comics will have to come back eventually because they mentioned that that specific license, AVP, in the in the press conference, and they're already doing versus Wolverine versus Black Panther and versus the Avengers before we get AVP. And I'm like, come on, guys! It's been How? 20 years. You don't have even if those movies were terrible to you, you don't have to let that taint every future project. But How I long have you been suffering that take... opium though from the press release? <laughs> Until we finally get those comics, I guess. We know there's at least two Predator film projects on on the Wii, which are arguably done on the strength of positive word of mouth prey. Uh So I think if, big if, Romulus lives up to the hope, I think at that point, there there are going to be meetings at Disney. They're going to be saying maybe now we should start dipping our toes in that water. But it, I think a lot's going to depend on Romulus. I, I agree. To I completely agree there, but I also think that will also play into the influence that Fede can have and that Dan Trachtenberg can have. If he hits it out of the park again with Badlands, you know, he's already basically positioned as the Kevin Feige of, of the Predator at franchise. You know, if he hits it out of the park again, we know he likes that concept. Fede also seems to have some interest in that concept. And if he does well with Romulus, if you've got these two guys pushing it, then perhaps perhaps they might start to take the concept a bit more seriously. And it is sad that it has become this sort of cursed concept within, within Disney and within 20th century. I think, was it Josh Izzo was talking about it on Perfect Organism? Um the sort of cursed thing that it had become in their their meeting. Well, know. that was that was pre Disney that he was referring to in the later. I'm sure he said time. it was still. I'm sure he said it was still considered that way at Disney. He had heard from people still in those kind of positions. At least that's my memory of the interview. Um, I'd like to see that changed. I want to see that comic, a, a new comic come out because it, Dark Horse ended on such a really strong note. Thicker Than Blood was fantastic. It's one of my favorite AVP stories. But then all we've had since then was, well, we had Ultimate, Ultimate Prey, Prey, which we enjoyed uh, for the most part. I think there was, what, like two stories in there we weren't really keen on. But the the original novel we have, um, Rift War, I can't even make it through the first 20 pages of that thing. That's how bad it is. It needs there needs to be something good. There needs to be something strong to revitalize interest in the concept because it is a strong concept. A game, for God's sake, we haven't had a new AVP game since two thousand and fourteen. Two thousand twelve with Evolution. Okay. We recently had that Disney leak, didn't we? There weren't any AVP no. things mentioned no. in it, were there? Or at least none that have been found it in that data. Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't mean to say there are no. It just means to say there weren't any in that particular batch of data. But The, um, yes. the concept still has strength. You know, yeah. it is still one it's of the... It's all about few... execution. 
Yeah. It's one of the few crossovers I genuinely think works at just a base level. Yeah. The franchises oh. feel oh. At, um, like they work together perfectly if you get it right. And games have, comics have, even books have in the past. And so I feel like if, like you said, Aaron, if this is reintroduced in the expanded universe slowly through comics, uh, have Rebellion do another game, I think maybe we'll get to the point that a cinematic, you know, we could we could have them dig up that old sarcophagus and give it another shot. Literally. Okay, then, folk. Um, I think it's time to wrap up then. We'll let Adam escape. So thank you so much for listening or watching. Um, you can find us on our main hub of activity, which is our website, avpgalaxy.net. We are also on all the major social channels, Facebook, X, Instagram, and Threads. A big thank you to our Patreon supporters. If you'd like to support what we do at AVP Galaxy, check out patreon.com forward slash AVP Galaxy. And thank you to the patrons who have been watching us live today as well. I'm sorry we haven't really commented on much of your stuff or put it on the stream today. It's because I set this up as a private video to start with, not unlisted. And it wouldn't show us the comments in, um, in our little interface here. But normally we would be, yes, um, throwing up comments that they were making and um, talking about them. Um, so if you want to come and interact with us like that, then um, come and pop on our Patreon and get involved. We also have the Genetic Memories podcast, which is exclusive to our Patreon supporters, which is us talking about tangentially related things to Alien and Predator. Our most recent episode was on... Oh, I forgot his name. Um, with... Galaxy of Terror. Yeah. Um, on Galaxy of Terror, which is what Jim had, Jim Cameron had done um, previous to Aliens, and it was a lot of Aliens DNA in there. Um, and it's it's interesting to explore those. And that's just for patrons. And of course, if you want to come and nerd out with fellow like-minded folk online on an old school message board. That is still the best way to discuss things on the internet because fuck the unorganization of Facebook and Discord. Uh, come and join us on avpgalaxy.net forward slash forums. Register an account and come join in. There's no better time for it than at the minute with Romulus coming out by the time this episode comes out. I think it's the, the day of or the day before the release of Romulus as well. So come and join us and um, talk about the new film. All right. Well, thank you everybody for listening or watching. This has been Corporal Hicks. Bridge top. Xenomorphing. This is Darnus signing uh, off. And a belayed thank you for Joe as well, yeah. who has disappeared before we had a chance to say goodbye. Still. Indeed. So, sorry. I'm too, I, I've hit the point where I know too many of you by <laughs> yeah. your real names now. Um, but yes, thank you everybody. And thank you to Darkness for joining us as well. And thank you to the patrons. And uh, we'll see you next time. Yep. Yeah.